June 1989, and this is Comics Comment. I'm your host, Robin, fellow comic word nerd, Robin Taylor. This month, Tiananmen Square protests continue with 100,000 protesters blocking 10,000 soldiers who then fire on the crowd. The best Star Trek movie, Star Trek V, opens in theaters, and Canada is rocked by Olympian Ben Johnson testing positive for steroids. Lame. I turned 18 and fell in love with a stripper in Hull, Quebec this summer. We sang Skids Rose, I'll Remember You, and I'll Never Forget Her. It was beautiful. Marvel Comics continues exploring adult themes and issues across the line, despite produce, producing Comics Code approved all ages books. In Punisher Warzone this month, writer Carl, Par Carl, Carl Potts and artist Jim Lee introduce illegal fur trading and poaching in the mix. Frank accompanies an aid mission to the Congolese jungle, only to discover that mercenaries and poachers are killing gorillas for their heads and hands. This leads to a collision course with Wolverine, who's on a similar mission to discover who's bringing illegal fur to Madripoor. The fur trade was a hot button topic at the time, leading to all forms of media, including Lethal Weapon 2, uh, to condemn this disgusting trade. In the X-Men universe, the girls' night out one-off is followed by a boys' night out only issue. Rob Liefeld takes the art chores, revealing his enormous talent for not drawing things like feet, hands, and human anatomy. As the lead artist on DC's Invasion crossover from years prior, Leefield re revisits some of that story in a parody featuring the world-shattering threat of the Gene Bomb. This is a silly issue that is shooting for parody and mostly misses the target. In Excalibur, the apparently always topical threat of Nazis. For real, if you'd asked me in 1989 that if in 2020 Nazis would still be a problem, I would have told you you're crazy. These interdimensional fascists, fascists have been brought to our world from a world where Germany won World War II. They make short work of the distracted and compromised Excalibur. Alan Davis' art returns and it is gorgeous. Across Captain America and the West Coast Avengers, John Walker returns from the dead. Slightly brainwashed and repurposed by the US government to be their own personal Captain America. Walker rubs the everyone in the WCA wrong the wrong way immediately. The Vision Quest storyline is wrapped up with a paradigm shift in the nature of the Vision himself. Having been kidnapped and then completely disassembled by the US government, Vision is now restored, but not completely. Essentially an amalgam of Simon Williams and Hank Pym's brains, uh, Vision grew to fall in love, marry, and have kids with Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch. That Vision's completely lost in the rebuild, and while his memories are restored, he has no emotional capacity. Simon Williams, Wonder Man, refuses to give Vision either his feelings back or his glorious mullet. Wanda struggles with losing her husband twice as this new Vision has no physical or emotional connection to her. This story is a great example of how John Byrne uses his encyclopedic knowledge of the Marvel continuity to paint outside the lines while not contradicting what is already known and what's happened before. Captain America has parallel stories in which John Walker's former partner Lamar Hoskins begins the search for the truth in Walker's apparent suicide. And Cap takes a trip down memory lane collecting defeated mechanical enemies for storage on Avengers Island. Walker is revealed by the government to be completely brain wiped as a new tool for the military. And then he's deployed to the West Coast Avengers. Kieran Dwyer's art is strong and it's reminiscent of a cross between Ron Friends and John Byrne of this era. He followed Paul Neri's run on Captain America and it is a great fit for the series. In a dramatic but essentially flashback issue of Iron Man, Tony Stark's friends all reflect on their lives with him as he's under surgery. Tony lives, but in a dramatic and unexpected twist, he's now paralyzed from the waist down. This was really wild development back in the day, and it would stretch on for the rest of the year. In Daredevil, Matt is appropriately Catholic guilt -y about cheating on Karen with Typhoid Mary. As he's unable to appropriately flagellate himself, he instead turns into revenge against the superpowered mercenary Bullet. Bullet's young son befriends Daredevil and prevents him from killing his father. The mercenary tells Matt it wasn't personal and is willing to drop the whole thing given how long he gets, how well he gets along with his son. Whiny, sad Matt simply decides to leave New York completely and buys a one-way train ticket. Cloak and Dagger was one of the bi-monthly treats Marvel offered at the time. In this issue, 
is, uh, has Dagger newly blind and learning to maneuver through her surroundings after being attacked last issue. Cloak is presumed dead after, his, after disappearing in space. His titular Cloak makes his way to Dagger and she eventually proclaims her love for him at his gravestone. His Cloak is also recovered by the villain Ecstasy who has lost the Cloak in a previous issue of Doctor Strange. She uses it to get naked as much as possible while taking over drug manufacturing by organized crime bosses. Cloak and Dagger was always a niche series, but I really dug it. And like it, the yin and the yang nature of the characters and also Rick Lenardi would become on board as art and do some really interesting stuff. Avengers is yet another middling issue introducing Spider-Man's foe Puma to the team as well as a battle with the Hulk enemies, the UFOs. Next month things get better. This month in Fantastic Four, an historic event is told again in mediocre fashion as Ben Grimm is returned to human form again, complicating things. Things is that Ben's girlfriend and teammate Sharon is trapped in an orange rocky body, one she took to be with Ben. I'm not a fan of writer Steve Englehart's work on Fantastic Four or on West Coast Avengers. He has a real problem with women. He wrote a Mockingbird story in which she's. Um, like kidnapped and brainwashed and raped and doesn't mean it's okay with and uh, he seems to only be able to write women who are subservient to men or only recognize them in their absence or presence not as their own people to talk about Thor for a moment I'm not a fan of this era of Thor by Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends Friends was a familiar favorite on Spider-Man for much of the 80s but when he took on Thor his art turned into an homage or as I like to say copy of Jack Kirby. This was intentional as DeFalco was channeling as best he could Stan Lee's voice on Thor from the 60s. However, as a follow-up to Walt Simonson's Thor run, it feels like a step backwards and it's uninspired. They do their best with the format they have chosen, but it feels dated immediately. Hulk continues the mediocre Glorian storyline with Glorian tormenting Joe Fixick with visions of Banner as his greatest foe. Lame. Venom returns for realsies and is hunting the Parkers in Amazing when Black Cat gets in the way. He brutalizes her, revealing that she too is looking for Peter Parker. Venom and Spidey have a fight in a meatpacking plant where Spidey gets covered with guts and blood and then he runs away. It's felt like filler for the next issue. Todd McFarlane's weaknesses as an issue are never more present than his, but his use of vertical frames brings a lot of energy to this book. He's never more challenged than when he's asked to draw two people having a conversation and he does that He's asked to do that a lot in this issue big things are afoot for next month with changes happening to several titles in the lineup Will July be better? There's only one way to find out join me next episode. This is comics comment. I'm Robin Taylor Excelsior